All praise is due to Allah and may Allah's peace and blessing be on the last Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and on all those who follow the path of righteousness until the last day. Uh, this evening we will be looking at the final topics of this intensive course in Uloom al-Hadith or Usul al-Hadith and uh, you now have the books in your hands Alhamdulillah please just double check that your book ends on page 87 with the bibliography if it doesn't there are some copies that uh, due to printing I don't know mistake I found a copy with, which ended only on page 77 so if you have a case like that, you should go back and exchange it, or we'll arrange to exchange it for you. The topics of uh, this evening, one, we'll be looking at the, in the notes to page 19, Nineteen and twenty. This is an example of uh, the hadith from Prophet Muhammad in which he said that if anyone among you wakes up from sleep, he must not put his hand in a utensil until he has washed it three times, for he doesn't know where his hand was during sleep. So this hadith, it's mentioned that there were at least 13 students of Abu Huraira who transmitted this hadith from him. And the breakdown of where they're from, right? If you turn over the page, this is the chart of what the hadith looks like. You know? And on the right-hand side of the page uh, is the Prophet Muhammad and the companions who narrated it, you can see Abu Huraira, you can see Ibn Omar, Jabir, Aisha, and Ali. And then Abu Huraira's students are the next level. And then on the far left, these are the main collectors at the end of each chain. We start from the bottom, for example. It says, I am, that's Ibn Majah, right? From Ali, that hadith was collected in Ibn Majah. And you'll see B. Khuzayma, which is Ibn Khuzayma. You have Ahmed here. This is the, this is the Musnad of Ahmed going up the list. Right? But the last one represents the book in which they have been collected. Or the same hadith has been collected. Some of them you'll see MU. MU represents Muslim. NAS is Nasai. You see that? I Khuzayma is Ibn Khuzayma. Okay? So that is just uh, something that we talked about, and it's good for you to see it in print uh, much better than just uh, speaking about it. And you can see how difficult it would have been for me to have put it on the board. Okay. The other. Uh, point that we'd like to look at also, if we go to page 40, we spoke about the classification of the narrators of hadith according to their eras, that is the era classification, there it is on page 40, uh, beginning with the Sahaba at the top, and the next levels you can see they have broken it down the tabi'un are broken down to uh, three different levels of tabi'un major tabi'un medial tabi'un lower medium tabi'un sorry and minor tabi'un so there are four different levels of tabi'un and the explanation is given on the right what you know who they represent then, 
if we go over to page 41, 41 represents the classification of the narrators according to their uh, memories, their ability to memorize dot, this is the, their accuracy. And the terminology is on the right hand side. Uh, you can see the first level, first class is the Sahaba, and the terms used to refer to them. Second class uh, would be from the Tabirun, and they would be called, and it could be Tabirun actually, at any, any level, where the person was known to be uh, highly reliable, then they would be given t names like Thiqa Thiqa, or Thiqa Hafid, or Awthaqun Nas, or thiqa thabt, there's other terms too, okay, and they're, they're listed there. So now, if we were to research a hadith, right, if we turn over to page 42, here is a hadith, uh, this hadith is uh, the narration found in uh, Tirmidhi, we see the chain of narrators at the very top of it, Haddathana Ali ibn Khashram, and so on and so, right? As the translation is there below the Arabic. Ali ibn Khashram reported that Isa ibn Yunus reported from Ubaidullah ibn Abi Ziyad al Qaddah, from Sahar ibn Hawshab, from Asma bint Yazid, that the Prophet said Allah's greatest name is in these two verses. And the two verses mentioned from the Quran, right? Uh, this is mentioned down at the bottom after that, collected by Tirmidhi, who classified it as Hassan Sahih. Uh, he used both terms. And um, this hadith is also collected by Ibn Majah and Ahmed. So now, if one wanted to research this hadith, there are steps that you would follow. And it's left for you to do it on your own. Uh, I've, the steps are given and the material necessary to fo follow the steps are there. I mean, I'll just go through it here now with you. So the first step would be to list the narrators of the hadith and write down the key points from their biographies found in Taqrib at tahdeeb Of course, you don't have Taqrib at tahdeeb but if you flip over to pages 44, 45, and 46, I have taken five pages out of uh, Taqrib al tahdeeb and translated the pages for you. This is what it would look like. So you get an idea of what the, the, book, the books which are classifying the people involved in the hadith and how they're classified and the information about them. So, for example, if you listed down the narrators and you wanted to, of course, the, you, when you're doing the check of the chain, you can either start at one end which is the last narrator from Khashram, Ali ibn, uh, ibn Khashram, or you could start from Asma bint Yazid, who is the Sahabiya, right, who should be the Sahabiya, narrating from Rasulullah she should have been a companion, female companion of the Prophet okay, so for example, if we were to begin with uh, Asma, then we would go to a uh, page, you, you would flip through these pages until you find, actually, it is on page 46, that is the section of those books, they put all the women together. On page 46, you'll say, Taqrib al Tahdeeb, volume 2, page 589. Huh? And these are the, how the names would be listed. You would then go through these names and look to see uh, if you can find Asma bint Yazid. The names are or organized uh, alphabetically, but of course it's alphabetically according to the Arabic alphabet, okay? so. Uh, you know, it may not appear because you, you'll get the name Asma and then they will be bit somebody. The name which follows it, that is the name that they will put alphabetically. So, of course, like the first one is Asma bint Abi Bakr, right? Then we have Asma bint Zaid. So, now, of course, Z or Z is the end of the alphabet and uh, A is the beginning, but then after that, you have Asma bint Said. Right, and this is S, really. S should have come before Z, right, or Z. Hmm? But as I said, this is in accordance with the Arabic alphabet, right, not the English alphabet. So you'd, you'd have to bumble your way through here till you ran into Asma bint Yazid, and we have one, 
two different Asma bint Yazids, right? Uh, one, uh, and then there's a description about her, right? Her kunya being Um Salama, etc., etc. Et she was, says, was a Sahabi at the end of it. And she narrated many hadiths. And then there are two symbols after it. You see Kha, you see Na'ayn and Meem. Okay, so then what you would do, you go to page 43. On page 43, you have a list of the symbols used in uh, in um, Taqrib al-Tahdeeb, which would let you know which books have recorded her hadiths. So you had Kha, and you look in here to see what it meant. Kha means Bukhari in his Sahih, Sahih Bukhari. Then you had Ayn Mim, right? And then Ayn Mim down the bottom, he said, if the hadiths are collected in all four Sunan and not in Bukhari and Tirmidhi. So Ayn Mim indicates that she has uh, hadiths, uh, you know, her hadiths have been collected in both Bukhari and Sunan and Tirmidhi, okay? So now we look at the other um, Asma bint Yazid. Huh? Yeah, not recorded in Bukhari and Muslim, right? No, they're using Bukhari and Muslim together, right? If her hadiths are found in all of the Sunan, right? But not found in Bukhari and Muslim together, meaning Muttafaq alayhi. Okay. But in her case, you see, they've said it's both. She is her hadiths are found in the Sunan, all four, as well as Bukhari, but not Muslim. That's the point. Okay. So if you look at the next person, go back to page forty-six. Her name is Asma bint Yazid, right? Al Qaisiya, Al Basriya, from the sixth level. Right, and you flip back over, who are the sixth level? Flip over to page 40. Okay, the sixth level here, these are contemporaries of the minor tabi'un, not known to have met any of the sahaba. So this couldn't possibly be the asma about here. If there were two sahabiyat, both of them were sahabiyat, then we'd have to look to see well, which books were they recorded in? Is this one, uh, well, she's recorded in Tirmidhi, and it said that she is, does have a hadith in Tirmidhi. And furthermore, Asma bint Yazid al qaisiya she has seen after her name, seen meaning what? That her narrations are in Sunan and Nasa'i. Right? So one, she's from the wrong level. Two, uh, the hadith that we have narrated here is from Tirmidhi indicating that it couldn't possibly be her and therefore what we're speaking about is the Sahabiya Asma bint Yazid the first one we meant Ibn al-Sakan al-Ansariya okay so if you started from that end then you'd go to the person after that the next person in the chain right next person after Asma was Sahar Ibn Haushab Right? Sahar ibn Haushab. So then you'd need to go flipping through these pages for Sahar. Right? Okay, which page is Sahar on? He's on page four uh, he's on page forty-four. Okay. Sahar ibn Haushab. This is from page three fifty five of Tahdib uh, And Sahar ibn Haushab al Ashari. Ashami, and it said here uh, that he was the Mawla, meaning Mawla, meaning freed slave of Asma bint Yazid ibn a second. That's confirming that he met her. So this is this is information which is confirming. Obviously, if he was a freed slave, then he obviously had access to whatever saying she she, she said. And then with the ruling on him, he's, he's got uh, hadith in Ayn Mim, which means all the Sunan, that links him to Tirmidhi also. And he is from the third level. We flip back to the third level on page 40, which is the medial tabi'un. 
and he is he is declared uh, and uh, he is declared as where is he as Saduk Saduk Kathir al Irsal Irsal meaning that a lot of his hadiths were Mursal right and Wal Awham as he has some mistakes in his narrations but he, and they label him as being Saduk Saduk that level right you just put after it he's from the Saduk is from the fourth class Right? He's between the fourth and fifth class. So you would list their names and put the ruling on them, right? One after the other. Just this is something you can do as an exercise for yourself. You know, work your way through it and see if the conclusion which uh, uh came to concerning the uh, the his judgment on the hadith being Hassan Sahih is correct or not. If it's Hassan Sahih what he is referring to is that it's really a Hassan hadith which is Sahih Lighayrihi. It's a Hassan Sahih, that was his terminology. He used Hassan Sahih together, meaning it's a Hassan hadith in itself, it's Hassan Lidatihi, and it is Sahih Lighayrihi. Okay, so the second step, after listing the narrators and writing down the information about them, if any of the, had, the narrators are classified as Da'if, Meaning that the terms used are in class 7 to 12. The hadith is then, this is on page 42, and second step, the hadith is automatically classified as da'if. Then you go to the third step. You compare the times in which they were born and died, or whether these were teachers or not teachers. This will confirm whether they actually met each other. And four, uh, in, on the fourth step, even though if they were in the same time frame, but they were not known to have been under the same teachers, then again, this is an indicator that there was some break. This is the hidden break in the chain. The fifth step, if the chain appears continuous and any of the narrators are from class four to six, then the hadith is classified as Hassan. So assuming that the other narrators are all higher than class four, we had uh, Sahar ibn Hawshab as from class four, between four and five. So therefore that hadith, remember we said the ruling on the hadith is based on its weakest link. So the hadith couldn't be a hadith sahih lidatihi. Right? And then continuing step six, if the chain of narrators are all from classes one to three, if all of them are from one to three, then the hadith will be classified as sahih, meaning sahih lidati. Now, if after this was done, the hadith was found to be daif, or it was found to be hasan, step seven, you would then go and collect up the other narrations of this hadith, which we have here on page 46 at the bottom, this is another narration of the hadith found in Sunan Ibn Majah and found in Musnad Ahmed. These are two other narrations of the hadith. And then you would go through and do the same thing with their chain of narrators. So if they were found also to be da'if, but da'if because of memory factors, not da'if because there was a liar in the chain or something like this, right? Or if there was somebody Majhul in one chain, but this was not shared. That same person was not in that same position in all of the other chains. Then these hadiths can strengthen each other and elevate it now to Hassan Lighayri. If the hadith was in fact Daif, those multiple chains could elevate each other up to Hassan Lighayri. Okay? If the hadith was Hassan, and the other chains are also Hassan, then they can elevate themselves up now to the level of Sahih Nighayri. Okay? I mean, this is something we talked about on a theoretical level before. 
Now you have it in your hands. You can go through the exercise of trying to do it yourself, you know. And um, after the examination, you can tell me what your findings were. Okay? Now, uh, some of you asked about the female narrators of hadith. They can be found on page 82. 82 to the end, 82 to 86. This discusses the female narrators of the hadith, you know, who are teachers of many of these major scholars that we spoke about, whether they are from the time of the Prophet Muhammad, uh, female narrators like Hafsa, Um Habiba, Maymuna, Um Salama, and Aisha, these are the, the leading narrators amongst the females from the time of the Prophet Muhammad, the companions, or from the time of the Tabi'un. You had Hafsa bint Ibn Sirin, Um Darda the younger, Amra bint Abdul Rahman, and she was the uh, main one of the main students of Aisha. And uh, in fact, she was also the teacher of Abu Bakr ibn Hazm, who was the first person that Omar ibn Abdul Aziz asked to begin the major compilation of the Hadith into major texts. Okay. And from the generation after it, the people are mentioned there. So, I mean, if you wish to read up something, uh, some more, have a, an inner look at some of the um, female traditionalists or female muhaddithat, then you can uh, read that section. I mean, we're not going to go into, I've not really gone into the male narrators and their lives and these kind of things. No, our time is quite uh, short. So uh, this is for you to read for your further information. And there are details which we didn't cover in the class. You know, you can find, for example, at the end of the section on um, uh, the, what do we call it, uh, the transmission of hadith, right? Oh, sorry, compilation of hadith. You have on page 12 through to page 14, this is biographical information about the leading narrators. You have Abu Huraira, Abdullah ibn Umar, Anas ibn Malik, Aisha, Umm al-Mu'mineen, Abdullah ibn Abbas, Jabir, Abu Sa'id, and Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al-As. Some biographical information about the major male narrators there. So, as I said, this is really just for your further reading uh, because access to the books on on the uh, science of hadith, you know, there are a limited number of books available in English. We have some in our library. At least you will have a compilation here of, you know, the essential material from, from these different sources is here. Right? Now, we also have from pages uh, 60 on through page. 81, 60 to 81, that's some 21 pages, where it's, the title there is bi biographies, but it's really not so much biographies as the books of hadith, right? These are the major books of hadith, which uh, when you are reading, when you are reading different Islamic works, you will find references made to one or other or a number of these books. Now, you have a uh, body of information here which can give you uh, greater insight into these books, you know, how reliable they are, who the authors were, etc., etc. So that information was also gathered here for your benefit. Now, the main topic for uh, this evening is the topic of Hadith al-Ahad. Oh yeah, right. 
I guess I don't need to do any writing now. You have the books in front of you. <laughs> Just remember. Okay. Um, so Hadith al Ahad. If you turn to uh, page 47, this is what we'll be addressing now. The Hadith al Ahad. Now, what does uh, Hadith al Ahad refer to? Generally speaking, Hadiths are divided into two main categories. Okay, try and pay attention to me. Now you have the book in your hand. Doesn't mean you just try to read from the book. Man. Try and pay attention to me. Uh, the hadiths are divided into two main categories: what are referred to as mutawatir, and what are referred to as ahad. The mutawatir hadiths are generally hadiths which on every level of the isnad on every level of the isnad there is a large number of narrators a large number of narrators a number which is so large that it would be inconceivable for them to have conspired to fabricate this narration and that is what is defined as mutawatir and the mutawatir hadith is classified as the same level as the Quran itself. That the Quran, how it came to us, is also mutawatir. That on each level of its narration, till the Quran was written all down in the copies that we have available, this has been handed down by such a large number of people, Muslims, different parts of the Muslim world, that it is impossible that they could have all conspired to create the Quran themselves. Okay? So hadith, which is on that level, is classified in that same way. Now, the hadith mutawatir are divided, or we could say that hadith mutawatir, the act, what is that number? Scholars have differed as to what is that large number. You know? And some say from any, any way from uh, 10 all the way up to 400 and they've put different numbers but there really is no clear consensus on the the number which would be defined as such a large number okay? but it is a, this vague large number but it is on all levels of the chain okay now this hadith which is mutawatir is divided into two categories itself the hadith which is mutawatir by laf, they call it by wording. Its wording is mutawatir, meaning all of the narrations of the hadith have exactly the same wording. Exactly the same wording. Or it may be mutawatir by meaning. Meaning that all of the hadith have basically the same meaning, but the wording has varied. The wording has varied, but the meaning is the same. Now, the hadiths which are mutawatir, or we call them verbal mutawatir, they are few. Scholars say maybe there's only about 10 such hadiths. Among them is the one, whoever lies on me deliberately will find his seat in the hellfire. Right? This is a verbally mutawatir hadith. Whereas, those which are mutawatir according to meaning, there are many. The hadiths which describe salah, describe hajj, all the various Islamic uh, acts which Prophet did, did, which were observed by many of his companions, etc., you will find a number of hadiths of this category, mutawatir according to meaning. Right? Now, what has been uh, concluded from this what does it mean on a legal level they say that the hadith which is mutawatir by uh, mutawatir whether by meaning or by or verbally mutawatir they say that it produces or it or it uh, imparts certainty certain knowledge what they call yaqeen and right? certainty of the content that we have no doubt it is in fact the words of our concepts which have been conveyed by Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. 
Now, the other category, is this too cold? Is this what it is? Um, the other category of hadiths are referred to as ahad. From ahad. Ahad meaning one. Right? Ahad. And this refers to any hadith who in its isnad, anywhere along the isnad, any level of the isnad, you will find that the number of narrators have not reached the level of tawatur. This is it in general. It hasn't reached the level of tawatur. <coughs> At any point on the Isnad. Because the principle for, for Tawatur is that on every level there must be a large number. 10, 15, 20 narrators on every single level of the chain. Beginning with the Sahaba. Whereas the uh, Ahad, it means on some levels, maybe the Sahaba, maybe it's only two Sahabas who narrated it. Or those who narrated from the Sahaba may only have been a couple. Or something like this. You have only a few people at certain levels on the chain. Right? Any hadith which comes like that, they classify as ahad. Now, the position held by a number of the legal scholars, and especially in more modern times, is that the ahad hadith do not impart certainty. They impart information which has the possibility of it being incorrect. So they call it dhan. Dhan. Right? In the first case, mutawatir imparts yaqeen. Mutawatir is from all, on all levels. On all levels, it must have a large number on all levels. Right, this is the mutawatir. Whereas, as I said, the ahad, it has uh, maybe on the first level, there's only a couple of companions, one or two or three. And after that, there may be only on the next level, two or three. Right? Or one. Because it could be one uh, tabi'i who heard from three companions. And he mentions, I heard it from this companion, that companion, the other companion. But he is the only one who narrates from all three of them. He may be one, or maybe two of them. Any, in any case, if such a situation occurs, they call this hadith ahad. Ahad meaning solitary, on its own sort of thing. Okay. And as I said, they hold that it does not... Uh, impart certainty, yaqeen, absolute certainty about its content. There is a possibility for error. So we believe, we say, they call it al-dhan al-rajah. There is the overwhelming belief that this is correct. But there is that element of doubt there. So this is the distinction in terms of how they look at the two. Okay. Now, what does that mean in uh, practical terms. In practical terms, some scholars have taken the position that the hadith, which is ahad and ahad, may be used in establishing points of law. Everybody basically agrees they can be used to establish points of law. However, they make a distinction and they say that it cannot be used to prove points of aqidah. They say only the mutawatir can be used to establish points of aqidah. Whereas uh, what is established by the ahad is points of law. This is a distinction which they make. And in support of that distinction, they have, you know, drawn from some verses of the Quran. We'll look into that in a minute. Now, 
the Ahad Hadith may be divided into three other groups. The Mashhur, which is a narration which on the first couple of generations there may have only been a couple of people who narrated, but on all of the subsequent generations of the Atba Tabi'in and those who came after them, there were huge numbers, right? Like the Mutawatir. But the first generation there may only have been one Sahabi or a couple of Sahaba or a couple of Tabi'in, right? So it, within the first uh, generation, it is possible that there was a few narrating, but subsequent generations there would be large numbers. So they call this hadith mashhur. Those hadiths which have at least two narrators on every level of the chain, they refer to this as aziz. Aziz. Aziz meaning really valuable. Right? Mashur meaning well known. And if there is a hadith on which in which there is only one narrator right, on any level of the chain, then that hadith is called gharib or strange. Gharib. Okay? This is a further breakdown. Now the scho this the uh, scholars beginning with Abu Hanifa, in particular, in Iraq, they took the position that the hadith to establish points of law had to be mashhur. This is the condition that they made. The hadith had to be mashhur. And as such, certain uh, hadith, certain hadith, which became well known in, in, uh, in its narration and its practice uh, in later generations, uh, like the hadith, if a dog licks in your vessel, that you should wash it seven times, one of which should be with earth, clean earth. Right? It's a well known hadith. However, on the upper levels of its narration, there are only a couple of narrators. As a result, Abu Hanifa and those of his school, they rejected this hadith on the basis that the washing, the normal washing is, well-known washing is three times. When you're washing your hands before wudu, you wash three times. When you wake up in the night, like the other hadith mentioned, you wash three times. So this is the normal washing, they say, well, that one we're certain about. This other one, which is coming in a hadith, which is gharib, or Aziz, we will not accept. This is by Abu Hanifa or? Yeah, this is Abu Hanifa himself. His Abu Hanifa himself. Not all of his followers took that route, but he initially, and that was a position held by the Madhab. So they considered that hadith to be not reliable because of the fact that on the early levels there were uh, only a few narrators. Also, what they, they took the position that if a hadith was a had and it contradicted uh, the text of the Quran, right, or sorry, it contradicted Qiyas, any conclusion which is made by Qiyas, then such a ahad hadith would also be rejected. If it contradicted Qiyas, these are conditions which they said. Um, and the example of a hadith which is rejected on the basis of that is the well-known hadith with which the Prophet ﷺ said, whoever touches his privates should make wudu. So they rejected this hadith, arguing basically that, oh no, sorry, this was not in the case of Qiyas. This was in the case of it's being something which everybody should have known about. If it was, if this, the subject matter of the hadith was something which should have been common knowledge because it was such a basic practice, then they would not accept it since it wasn't. So this hadith, since it wasn't a 
narrated by many people, and it's something, the issue of touching your private parts and it breaking wudu should be something everybody should have known. So they took the position that it's not authentic because of that. However, mm-hmm. so the, the piece on page 19, the one we just read earlier, uh, would it be considered ahad then? Because it has four narrators and uh, in the first seven months? Which one? The, the one on page, uh, uh, yeah. No, that hadith, it would be considered at, at least mashhur. For those, because remember we said mashhur uh, was three narrators, right? If they had three or more, right? So a minimum of three. This is like five. And there are some people who consider five to be enough for tawatur. So the hadith is either mutawatir or at, at, at minimum it is mashhur. Okay. So, the point is that um, this hadith, as we said, was rejected uh, on this basis. However, the other scholars argue that, one, if the Prophet ﷺ performed hajj and those who narrated the description of his hajj did not each and every one of them narrate the complete descriptions we find of Hajj. No. If you go and you read in the books, you'll find some narrate a portion, others narrate another portion, some narrate another portion. Yet, 40,000 of them saw him make Hajj. So, the argument that simply because it is not narrated by a whole bunch of people doesn't necessarily mean that it was not known to them. And the assumption that they're making is that the fact that it is not narrated by many people is a product of it not being known to that early generation. But that may not necessarily be the case. It may just be that, as we mentioned, out of the many Sahaba who narrated hadith, we said those who narrated hadith were 1,060. 500 of them narrated only one hadith. Only one hadith. So if you go on down, how many other hadiths? You mean to say they only saw and heard one thing of the Prophet Muhammad the whole of the life that they spent with him? No. Of course they saw other things. But what they were absolutely sure about and the circumstance arose for them to talk about it, they passed it on. Otherwise, they may have been doing some of the other things, or probably doing some of the other things, but they didn't teach it. Because they weren't necessarily in a position to teach. The teaching was left to a smaller number of companions. So the majority of the other scholars reject this line of argument. The Hanafis also hold the position that if the person who is narrating the hadith is not a scholar of law, because amongst the companions, some of them were known to be jurists, legal scholars. Others just narrated the hadith. They didn't get into the meanings and implications and applications and things like this. So those that just narrated, they were just looked at as being hadith narrators. Whereas others who people used to come to and ask fatwas from, they used to make fatwas and do researches and things like this, these were known as the jurists. And the most famous of them are the, what they call the four Abdullahs. Abdullah ibn Abbas, Abdullah ibn Omar, Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al-As, and uh, one of the Abdullah. I forgot this, <laughs> who he was, but anyway, there are four of them. Uh, the point is that uh, these uh, were the known uh, jurists. So they took the position that if a hadith was narrated in which it went against a meaning which would have which would have been concluded by Qiyas, and the narrator from the Sahaba was not a faqih, a jurist, then they would take the Qiyas over the narration. They would reject the narration and follow Qiyas instead. You understand this? Remember what Qiyas was? Do you remember what Qiyas was? Huh? Yes. Yeah. It is Qiyas when you have a ruling in the Sharia, either in the Quran or the Sunnah, which says such and such a thing is haram, for example, 
then you come across something which is not mentioned in the Quran or the Sunnah and you want to know what ruling shall I put on this thing so you go to look in the Sharia to find some uh, ruling whose reason, the reason for its ruling has been identified which you can now find in that thing you want to put a ruling on and where they share that factor then you say we can apply that ruling to it. For example smoking smoking cigarettes right there wasn't any smoking in the time of Prophet Muhammad so some people say it must be okay no. No, we have to look back in the Quran and the Sunnah to see what effect does smoking have is there something in the Quran which or Sunnah which describes Is there something in the Quran which, or Sunnah which describes a substance having similar effect and it is labeled either haram, makru, or something? Now the early scholars when smoking first came to them in uh, the Ottoman Empire, right, when smoking tobacco first reached the Ottoman Empire, the Ottoman scholars, Muslim scholars in the Ottoman Empire, they looked at the effects and the only effect they could find was that it caused bad breath right? it caused bad breath the smoker's breath so they went back into the Sharia they found a hadith which, in which Prophet ﷺ said whoever eats raw onions and raw garlic do not come to our mosques stay home right now from that they concluded that the eating of raw onions and raw garlic is makru. Makru, makru, why? Makru meaning disliked. Better you didn't do it. Why? Because if it's going to cause you not to go to the masjid, and the Prophet ﷺ said prayer in the masjid is worth 27 times prayer at home, then it means it is causing you to lose out on this additional reward. Therefore, they concluded that it must be something disliked. Okay? So they said, since garlic and onions cause bad breath, smoking causes bad breath, we will rule them that smoke and garlic and onions is ruled as makru, we'll rule also that smoking is makru. However, in the late 70s, 1979, the Surgeon General the United States announced that it is conclusively proven that smoking causes cancer and cancer causes death. So now they had to go back, scholars, knowledgeable scholars now went back into the Sharia to see what is the ruling on substances which cause death. And of course the ruling on substances which cause death is haram. For you to take something knowing that it can kill you, it is haram. Right? So they say then, since smoking, a person who smokes cigarettes knows there's a great likelihood that they will die of cancer, it causes death, therefore the ruling on it should be haram. This is qiyas, this is deduction by analogy. You're comparing things, comparing the factors which are shared by them. Same thing with marijuana. People say, well, marijuana, there's no mar mention of marijuana in the hadith, it was not known. Arabia, whatever, so we can't say it's haram. <coughs> Foods, substances which we eat and consume, they're all halal unless you can find evidence to, to establish it being haram. However, when you go into the uh, hadith, what you find is that Prophet ﷺ said, Kullu muskirin khamrun, wa kullu khamrun haram. So the Prophet ﷺ, he defined khamr 
as being whatever intoxicates. Because the term khamar actually means the intoxicating drink which came from grapes. And this is why some scholars, you will find some scholars who hold that drinking intoxicants from grape juice, wine which comes from grape juice, this is haram. But if you drink whiskey which is made from potatoes, it's okay. This is the position which was taken at one point in time. Okay? The point is that Prophet clearly explained what is the cause of its prohibition when he said, Kullu muskirin khamrun, meaning whatever will intoxicate is khamr. Though the term khamr means the intoxicating drink from grape juices, in the language linguistically, Islam has given it another meaning, which is any intoxicant. So, since every, any, any intoxicant is now considered to be khamar, then we can, uh, and the khamar is haram, then we can go to marijuana. Does it intoxicate? Yes. Well, no, it intoxicates you. What is, what is khamar? Well, uh, Omar clarified, he said, khamar ma yukhamirul aql. Whatever will veil or cloud a part of the functioning of the brain. Right? Because somebody might smoke one and say, no, I don't get intoxicated. I'm not intoxicated. But it does impair judgment. Right? It does impair judgment. And again, it depends on the quantities. It depends on the quantities. So, Prophet Muhammad further clarified, ma askara kathiruhu faqaliluhu haram. Whatever intoxicates in large amounts, then in small amounts it is also haram. Right? So that sealed the door for any argument that marijuana may be acceptable. Right? So in the principle we are applying laws from what was known to what was not known. This is the process of analogy. So they concluded, Allah has made the sale of animals halal. There. As is considered halal. And only specific forms which have been prohibited would then not be acceptable. Riba, use of riba, you know, interest, this is what is forbidden. So, when the hadith of the Prophet, which was narrated by Abu Huraira, stating that you should not uh, tie the teeth of the goats so that their udders would become full with milk before selling. Right? Right? If you tie the teeth of the uh, goats and you feed them, they will produce milk and then their udders will become very fat, very big. So now when you take your goat to market coming with these huge big udders, they will say, wow, this is a very you know, good goat, it's going to produce a lot of milk and so on and so like this. So it is a means of deception here. Right? So Prophet Muhammad said, you should not do this. Of course, there are some goats that are going to produce a lot and it will be, their udders will be large. Okay? So Prophet Muhammad said, you should not do this. And if you as a buyer, if you as a buyer, you bought a goat or a sheep, with big udders, thinking that it was a good producer. You take it home, you milk it, you feed it, and it didn't fill up again. Right? <coughs> After three days, if you found this is the case, then <coughs> you are allowed to return the gold, get your money back, and you give them a sa'a of dates. Give a sa'a of dates for the milk that you took from it. Well, the uh, Hanafi scholars, they said, no. That hadith of Abu Huraira was narrated in the Ahad form. And Abu Huraira was not known to be a jurist. So any hadith <coughs> which is narrated by a Sahabi who wasn't a jurist, whose uh, contents contradict Qiyas, because for them, Qiyas would be 
that if you were to give the goat back, you would have to give what was equivalent in value to the milk that you took. Because the sa'a of dates may be less or it may be more. There's no guarantee that it is going to be equivalent. So, in other words, this contradicts the qiyas. Qiyas would be that you should give a, an amount which was equivalent to the amount that, the value of that milk which you took. So they rejected the hadith on the basis of it. <coughs> now, this, uh, this position, of course, this is human reasoning coming into uh, the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, which has been conveyed to us. Is this line of reasoning acceptable? This line, or the line which says that the ahad hadith can be accepted in laws, but not in aqidah. This is the question. Now, <clears throat> this claim is a questionable claim in and of itself. And it, the, 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 first, the claim of the Hanafites, uh, the Hanafis with regards to it uh, not being mashur or that it contradicts Qiyas. I mean, these are lines of reasoning, individual reasoning, which we have to ask ourselves, where did this come from? Was this understood in the time of the Sahaba? Did they apply this principle? Or where did it come from? The fact is <coughs> that when we look at the evidences in the Quran, which uh, command us to follow Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam for example whatever the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam gives you follow it and whatever he prohibits you leave it you know and this this type of instruction was understood by the Sahaba to mean whatever the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the Hadith told then you had to obey it, avoid, or do whatever you were instructed. A woman came to Abdullah bin Mas'ud and said to him, I heard that you were forbidding women from plucking their eyebrows. I heard you were forbidding. Is it in the book of Allah? And he said, yes it is. So, she said, I have been through the book of Allah from cover to cover, and I have not found it anywhere in the Quran. I have not found it anywhere in the Quran. He said, haven't you read the verse, whatever the Prophet has given you, take it, and whatever he told you to leave it, leave it. So, they understood that that includes everything which was conveyed through the hadith. You don't uh, say, well, it's in the Quran. It's in the Quran. Everything that ends up in the Hadith ends up in the Quran because Allah said in the Quran, "May yuti'ur Rasul faqad Allah." Whoever obeys the Messenger has obeyed Allah. So, this instruction was this instruction an instruction? Meaning that if any individual came to you and provided you with this information, that was sufficient? Or did a whole group of people have to come and tell you this? This is the question. How did the companions understand this? Practically speaking, you will not find anywhere in the Hadith or the Quran anything which distinguishes between Aqidah and Law. Submission meant submission to Islam. Whether it were the, the practices, the economic law principles, or it was belief in the Day of Judgment or whatever, they're all interlinked. And that's what we see with the pillars of Islam and Iman, isn't it? And the pillars of Islam, these are 
the practical, legal things that we have to do. And the pillars of Iman are the principles of belief that we must hold. And this belief is linked to the actions. If we drop any of the actions, we're falling into this belief. If we drop any of the beliefs, we're also falling into this belief, right? So there is no separation between action and belief in terms of what we have to accept. Hmm? So those who make this claim, those who claim that the hadith ahad are only valid in areas of law, they are required to bring proof. Now, the proof which they commonly bring in um, uh, chapter 53, verse 23, in which Allah says there, they follow nothing but dhan and that which themselves desire. And also there's another narration, another verse in the Quran where Allah says in verse in chapter 10, verse 36, certainly dhan will not avail you against the truth. Right? These are the two verses which they argue that on the basis of this we should not accept these hadith al-ahad in areas of aqidah because Allah here can impart dhan knowledge. It doesn't impart yaqeen. It imparts knowledge which is got an element of doubt in it. This is their argument. However, if one goes to see the context in which these verses were revealed, because again, this is the danger. What we took earlier in our studies in Usul al-Tafsir, that if you take verses from the Quran, Allah says he's closer to you than your jugular vein. And you then conclude that Allah is inside of you, inside your brain somewhere, inside your spinal cord, which is closer to you than your jugular vein. You have come to a wrong conclusion. Because there are many other verses in the Quran where Allah describes the fact that He's above His creation. So when we look at these kind of verses, we have to look at it within the context. When Allah said that, He talked about the fact that He knows what the, uh, the heart whispers, what is in your heart. He knows what is in your mind. He knows what you're planning. He knows. He talks about His, his knowledge. And then at the end of it, He says, and he's closer to you than you drug in a vein. So what is he speaking about here? His knowledge, not that he is inside you. This is a mistaken concept. There's a lot of people who hold this. You ask them, where is Allah? They say Allah is everywhere. He's in you, he's in me, he's everywhere. You know? This is a Christian concept. God is in human beings. Our souls are parts of God. Okay? Our soul is a part of God. It's a common belief among Christians. But it is problematic because if we believe or you hold the idea that your soul is a part of God, then what of those people who are cast into hell? Is the punishment of hell only on the body or is it also on the soul? It's on the body and the soul. So it means a part of Allah will be suffering in hell, punished. This is problematic. It's not acceptable. If the soul is a part of Allah, then it must be good because Allah is good. And see, so you raise all kinds of problems. Furthermore, as we talked about on our level of uh, in Usul al Aqidah, and that we talked about the point that. Once you say Allah is everywhere, and of course, this is the philosophy of the Hindus, right? The knowledgeable Hindus. The common Hindu, if you ask him, why is he worshipping his idol, you know, Ganesh, you know? Why is he pouring the uh, milk on the top of Ganesh's head, right? Burns his incense, puts little foods and things around Ganesh. He will say, because when I do this, I get good luck. My business is successful. My wife gets pregnant, we have boys, no girls, you know, so on, so on, so he goes and gives you a whole list of things why he worships Ganesh. Now, the more educated and more intellectual Hindu, he will say, 
I am not worshipping that idol that you see. It's not the physical thing we're worshipping. No. God is everywhere. And when I'm going to worship, I do my puja, then God becomes concentrated inside of my idol at the time of the worship. So I'm worshipping God who is concentrated inside of the idol. Not the idol, the physical thing that you see here. I'm worshipping God who is concentrated inside of me. It's a philosophy. Philosophy of idolatry. So that could have been deduced by people saying, taking that one verse of the Quran where Allah says he's closer to you than your juggler vein. You could end up falling into that, but you must look at that verse in the context of the the, the verse in which it, in the context in which it came, as well as within the context of the Quran and the Sunnah, etc. And then we can conclude really, in fact, that Allah is not inside of His creation; He's above and beyond His creation. And of course, we have authentic narrations where Prophet Muhammad did ask one of the female companions, "Where is Allah?" And she said, "Allah is above the heavens." Right? Finishing the argument. Anyway, the point is that those people argue that here is Allah condemning Dhan. But if you read the context of these verses, that's 53.23 and 10.36, if you go back and you read in the Quran, what is this talking about? This is speaking about the pagans. The pagans who, with their false knowledge, their false understandings, have made conclusions and are worshipping their idols and they have these misunderstandings about Allah. So Allah condemns it and says that this dhan is, has no, uh, it cannot avail against the truth. It has no standing in front of the truth. It's not reliable, right? And that those who follow it, you know, are condemned. Now is that dhan of the pagans where they have this idea that their idols uh, can act as intermediaries between themselves and Allah, right? which is falsehood. Is that the same as the dhan which comes from the hadith because we don't know 110%? Is that the same? Can we compare these two? Is this dhan applicable to that? If we said, if we just accepted the idea that yes, the hadith ahad does impart knowledge which we'll call dhan. It is done from the point of view that there is an element of doubt. Not from the point of view that the whole thing is baseless. Which is what Allah is saying about those people who worship idols. And the whole of what they are basing their worship on is false. And the conclusions and the actions that they have built on it are all false. This is the dhan which is condemned. Whereas the dhan which is an element which is where there's a human element, a possibility of error, that is not the equivalent to the, the, uh, the doubts or the doubtful or obscure understandings of the pagans. So first and foremost, their argument is rejected from this point. They don't really have evidence. In fact, their claim that the hadith ahad are only useful or can only be used in law, not in aqidah. This is in itself aqidah. This is an aqidah. This is a belief which they have developed. On what? A statement from Rasulullah Is there a clear statement from the Prophet A clear statement from the Quran or from the Sahaba to support this? No. The verses they use are obscure verses whose meanings they've taken out of context. So in fact, though they are saying we are trying to avoid this condemned dhan, by them taking this position, they have themselves fallen, fallen into the dhan. The dhan of the pagans, where they have built an, uh, a whole aqidah and concept and practice on something which is baseless. Something which is baseless. Now, if we look at the scholars of the past, the great scholars of the past amongst the Tabi'een, Imam Malik, Imam Abu Hanif and the others, they did not hold this position. Though Abu Hanif had this thing of the Ahad and the Mashur, this Hadith will accept the Mashur, but we won't accept the Ahad, if it contradicts our Qiyas, or if and if the narrator wasn't a, a, a jurist, you know, 
uh, he put some stipulations. Still, if they if these stipulations were not uh, were fulfilled, they he would accept ahad hadith, right? Now, this other position which they have taken is one which has no precedence in the understanding of the Sahaba and the major scholars who came after them. They, you can trace these ideas back to the period of the translation of the Greek books and the Persian books into Arabic where philosophies came along with these books. Philosophies, concepts which were foreign to the Islamic uh, teachings but which became absorbed in and given a terminology which made it seem and sound Islamic, right? Now, you, what you find in fact, when we look in the Quran and the Sunnah, what we find in fact are clear instructions from, the, from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to take knowledge from individuals take knowledge from individuals who have knowledge <laughs> ask those who know if you don't know the term those can apply to one person if you go and ask one person who knows and you don't know you have fulfilled the requirement of that verse that verse doesn't mean you have to go and ask mutawatir number it doesn't say this Allah tells us in the Quran to Ask those who know if we don't. And has not made this kind of stipulation. Furthermore, you can find in the Sunnah many instances where the companions accepted the judgment or the statements of individual companions as sufficient evidence for them to act on. In fact, Imam Bukhari, he has a chapter in Sahih al-Bukhari called accepting the ahad reports by a truthful man in the adhan in the prayer and the fasting inheritance laws etc he brings because from his time people had started to introduce this idea and he opposed it and fought against it bringing the evidences against it and he brings in his chapter on that he brings a number of hadiths from the prophet you know where instances involved uh, individuals given the responsibility of teaching the Muslims single individuals. For example, there's a hadith he narrated from Anas ibn Malik who said that the people of Yemen came to the Messenger of Allah saying, send a man with us to teach us Islam and the Sunnah. Now, when he is going to teach Islam and the Sunnah, was it just the laws or was it the laws and the Aqeedah? It was the laws and the Aqeedah. Not just going to teach them, you know, zakat and so on, so he's teaching them the aqidah along with it. Knowledge of Allah, knowledge of the unseen, all of that is included, right? So they asked, send us a man. If it were not permissible or not acceptable for one person to convey this information, Prophet would say, no, we'll have to send a group, right? That's the logical thing. One person, we cannot rely on just one person because there's an element of doubt in what he's going to convey. However, Prophet ﷺ said, this man, Abu Ubaidah, is the trusted man of the Ummah. And he sent Abu Ubaidah, one man, to go and teach him. We also know when the people of Medina accepted Islam, in the second uh, oath of allegiance, right? The Prophet ﷺ sent Mus'ab ibn Umair back with them to teach them. Was, what was he teaching? Only laws? Of course not. This was in the Meccan period. When, of those of you who were with me in the study on uh, the Usul al-Tafsir, right? The Usul al-Tafsir. You know that the Meccan verses focused on Akhira, Tawheed, etc. Things of Aqidah. Whereas it was the Medinan verses which focused on laws, etc., etc. So, Mus'ab ibn Umair was going to Medina primarily to teach them Aqidah. The 13 years in Mecca focused on Aqidah. We know this. So therefore, Mus'ab, one man, went to Medina and taught them Aqidah. So we know from the practice of the Prophet 
sending people like Abu Ubaidah, sending uh, Mu'adh ibn Jabal to Yemen, and others, individuals going and teaching, teaching both Aqidah and law, making no distinction, no separation between law and Aqidah. And we also have the example, for example, when the people were praying in Masjid Quba, and the revelation had come that the Qibla, the direction of prayer, had shifted from Jerusalem to Mecca, one man came and informed them whilst they were praying, and during that prayer, they turned in Quba. They prayed. They have a masjid there now. They call Masjid Qiblatain, right? Where there was two Qiblas, one to the north, which was Jerusalem, then one to the south, which became Mecca. But that Masjid Qiblatain is not authentic. It did happen. There was a Masjid, but that's not the Masjid. Anyway, just, so, just for general information, because they take people on these trips and say, you know, this is the Masjid, this is the this. The Prophet ﷺ stood here, and he sat here, and he walked here. Maybe they might tell you he even urinated here, you know. Yeah. This kind of information, this is nonsense. This is most, the vast majority of it is nonsense. Right? People have made these things up. It makes money. Tourism. Get the tourists, people coming, they're excited. Oh, we want to the place with the Hafsa Sam. Yeah, and if you make two rakahs, they've been making them. This is a, these are fabricated narrations. And if you make two rakahs in the Masjid of Qiblatain, this is going to come for you and that's going to It's nonsense. These are fabricated at least. This is people doing it for business purposes. Yeah, yeah, they've, they've, you know, they've built it up, so it gives you that impression. Anyway, the point is that in the masjid, when the information came to them that the Prophet Muhammad had instructed the revelation to come that they should shift to Mecca, they all turned and prayed towards Mecca. Right? One individual informed them and they changed the direction. So, we are, can also find in Imam Shafi's book called Ar Risala, where he has one chapter called, excuse us please, one chapter which is called and headed Evidence for the Necessity of Accepting the Ahad Reports. And he brings in it all of the verses of the Quran and Hadith proving this point. So, as we said, this is something which was not known to the early scholars, but something which was made up based on philosophies which did not have their basis in Islamic teachings. In general, if we take this argument, the argument that there is a difference in how we're going to deal with the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ with regards to laws and aqidah, we say this argument is a false argument. It is not supported by evidence from the Quran and the Sunnah. In fact, the Quran and the Sunnah go against it. And what in fact it leads to is the abandonment of hadiths. Because there are many hadiths. For example, like the hadiths of the, uh, the hadiths of uh, the return of Isa. Or the hadiths of the punishment in the grave. There are a number of hadiths concerning attached to aqidah. You know, much of the hadiths attached to aqidah came to us through Ahad narrations. If one takes that position really, then you're going to reject so much of what has come to be well known as parts of Islamic belief. What some scholars say is that if they are related to secondary issues of belief, we accept it. But the primary issues don't. No. How do you define the primary and the secondary? See, this all goes back again to aql, to the mind, where we're putting reason over revelation, narration. The hadith comes 
we're going to use our brains to say, well, you know, this does not go along with my qiyas. And the Sahabi who narrated it, he wasn't a jurist, so I'm not going to accept it. It's something that everybody should have known about. And since it was not narrated by a lot of people, it's not mashhur, I'm not going to accept it. It's on the area of aqidah. And since the hadith of Ahad only impart conjecture or generally believed, but there's an element of doubt, I can't accept it. All of this is human reasoning leading to the abandonment of hadith. Right? Human reason leading to the abandonment of hadith. And, <clears throat> for example, if we take the hadith where the Prophet ﷺ said, La salata liman lam yaqra bi fatihat al kitab. There is no salah for one who does not recite fatiha. Meaning you are able to recite it and you didn't recite it. This hadith in the Hanafi school and those who are involved in the, the same principle, they reject it because they say it goes against the mutawatir of the Quran where Allah says, فَقْرَأُوا مَا تَيَسَّرَ مِنْهُ Read whatever is easy for you from it. So it said, means if you read a piece of a uh, chapter anywhere in the Quran, that is sufficient. You don't need to read Fatiha. This is the official position of the Hanafi Madha. Though in what's being taught in terms of people are taught how to pray and everything, this is taught in, on a higher level. That's what the scholars have, that's the position they've taken. But really, there is clear hadith which states that the Fatiha must be read. And if they teach anybody that they don't need to read it, they are in fact affecting those people's salah. So, the bottom line is that we as Muslims are obliged to follow Allah and His Messenger. And that we need to keep focused on. We follow those who have more knowledge than us from the point of view of guidance, getting information, but we don't follow them blindly. If a saying of the Prophet ﷺ comes to us, we accept it. If it's authentic, we know it's authentic, we accept it and we follow it. Whether it goes against our desires or not, that is the submission. And if the person who we are seeking knowledge from, the scholar who we ask, if he says, and we ask, when he says, well, you do this or you do that, and you ask him, what is the evidence for that? And if he says, who are you to ask me about evidence? You know, you're ignorant. You're not a scholar. You're not a maulana or a sheikh or whatever. You know, you don't have any right to ask him this question. If his response is like that, he's unwilling to give you the evidence, he's arrogant, then this is a person who you should not seek knowledge from. It is a sign you need to go elsewhere. Because giving the evidence is a part of imparting knowledge. Imparting information without evidence is only training people in blind following. So. We seek knowledge, and we seek knowledge wherever it is available. We don't limit ourselves to one particular school or one particular teacher. We keep our minds open to absorb the information. Whenever authentic information comes to us, then we follow it. In this way, we have completed our shahada, you know, wa ashhadu anna Muhammadan Rasulullah. Otherwise, we are in danger of destroying the second half of our shahada. <clears throat> so, that basically concludes the
final topic of the course. Uh, we're now trying to look at uh, some of the many questions that you have. Uh, the examination will be multiple choice as, as you have rejected, if you requested. Secondly, I should uh, mention that a number of people have asked that the exam be postponed from Saturday to Tuesday because of the fact that the book has only just now come into your hands. I am doubtful about this, you know, but if the majority of you prefer to delay it until Tuesday, it's not a problem, you know. But I know the general pattern of students, maybe you can surprise me and this is not the pattern, the general pattern of students is that you study the night before. So whether we say Saturday and you study Friday night, or we say Tuesday and you study Monday night, what's the difference really? I mean, that's the general pattern. I, mean, I know that's the kind of student I was, 24. Those who prefer it, inshallah, let me try to answer uh, some of your questions from tonight and then those that are left over. Uh, what about the saying that to pass knowledge even if it was one word or so? So why didn't the people narrate the things they knew? <laughs> okay, Prophet Sallam had said, uh, Convey whatever you know from me even though it's only a single verse. The question is, if this was instruction from the Prophet Sallam, why didn't the others many sahaba didn't narrate anything as i said they left that responsibility to those who were already known to be quite knowledgeable who are the centers of the the pro process of learning they left it to them right and if an issue arose where you found this hadith, sahabi narrating a single hadith where uh, an issue arises the, the, the Khalifa he asked the people does anybody know this hadith you know the people around him first people he asked are those who are well known who are teaching etc none of them know about it but they wouldn't stop there they would send the word out does anybody know a hadith related to this so then one sahabi who heard this particular hadith he would come and say, I heard the Prophet say so and so. So this is his one hadith. Because this was a time when he was needed, he came and provided that knowledge. Otherwise, he went on about doing his regular life, living his Islam, and the things that he knew were being taught by the leading scholars whom people went to. <clears throat> My question is, among Muslims, is it compulsory for men to have beards or not? Yes, it is compulsory for men to have beards. Is it wajib or farm? There is no difference between wajib and farm. In the Hanafi school, they hold that farm is what has been commanded by Allah in the Quran and wajib is what is commanded by the Prophet in the Hadith, the Sunnah. But in fact, they say you must follow both. So, and the rest of the uh, Muslim scholarship, they all hold that fard is the same as wajib. And in fact, linguistically they are. <clears throat> if they fail to do so, what are the consequences? They are in sin. Please explain this with reference to Quran and Hadith. Well, the Prophet had said, grow your beards and trim your mustaches. And Allah said, whatever the Prophet commands you, take it, do it. So, this is the basis for it. It is haram for Muslims to shave their beards. Uh, the issue of trimming the Sahaba uh, did trim the beards. So, trimming is permissible. It's not a requirement. In fact, they show that basically Prophet Muhammad probably trimmed because for them, the numbers of them to have trimmed it implies that, and especially those who actually narrated the hadith of growing the beard, it implies that it was the practice of the Prophet also. 
that in fact to grow the beard beyond the length, the length of the fist, a number of scholars hold that that is not in keeping with the sunnah. That the beard should be trimmed, you know, it shouldn't go beyond the fist. That is fist. Is that Jafon Abulu? Jafon? Jafon The majority side? Say that it's. The, the, the fist. No, some scholars, I mean, some scholars. Mm -hmm. I heard that uh, if the beard grows above this, you're not supposed to touch the beard with the intention of cutting it or trimming it. Well, that goes right against the practice of Ibn Omar found in Sahih Bukhari. That he used to take his beard and whatever was beyond the fist, he would cut it off. And Ibn Omar was the one who narrated the hadith which said, grow your beards and trim your mustaches. So, the position of the Taliban on this issue is wrong. They're wrong on this issue. Where they're lashing people who trim their beards. You know, it's an extreme position they've taken and the evidence does not support them. Is plucking eyebrows a sin? Yes. Prophet ﷺ said that the woman who plucks the eyebrows for another woman and the woman who has her eyebrows plucked are cursed by Allah. Okay. okay. We got a lot of questions here. But high heels, if the high heel and, and um, the medical profession have shown that high heels damage the knees, the cartilage in the knees, these type of things, so it's damaging, it's harmful. Furthermore, uh, it, uh, you know, it, it distorts their, affects the back with the position of the spine with regards to it. And furthermore, it gives them a wiggle, which they, which becomes, you know, attracting people in this this way, which as we know this is not permissible Islamically. Uh, so in general, you know, the scholars approve that wearing high heels is not permissible for women, and also it's imitation of kufar. In the end, it's, it's imitation of their fashion. What is the right way of doing niya in the beginning of each prayer? The right way is to know what you're doing. That's the right way. There's nothing you need to say.